myself. Um, my name's Owen Singh. This is a short talk. Oh, thank you. Um, I feel I'm the only person who's kind of introduced my talk by dragging people in here. I hope that you're not too disappointed, those people who've been dragged in here. But I can't resist trying to be like a circus. And we're going to look at a beautiful animal of the octopus family called Seth. It's a storage system, and it's been getting a lot of attention by a lot of people. Um, it's really for big data centers, so it's a little bit hard to sell to uh, individuals. But it's much easier to sell to people who have lots of computers. But enough from the background. About me, this is really my third distributed storage project. And I've touched a few others in the meantime and in gaps between them. Um, I've been working at Suzy for um, more than two years on Ceph. I'm a software maker, and I like to hear admins' complaints, and I like to fix them. And that's a little bit about me. And a little bit about the basics of what Ceph is. So some people sit there and hate C++ and walk out. This is a C++ project. We make no excuses for it. It's a Python project for some of the CLI stuff and some of the user interface stuff. Um, I think it's a very elegant design. And compared to all the other storage systems that I've ever seen, it's the simplest. And I hope to convince you it's simple. Um, and some of its really cool things is it's very friendly to sysadmins. It's got self-healing. It's very, very scalable. It has very high I.O. And it has no single point of failure. And that's my starting bit on what is the nice bits of Ceph. So, first thing I'm going to do is talk about something really in the core of Ceph. And the best way to talk about it is to compare it to other storage systems. Most storage systems, you have the client, and I've skipped the authentication bit and all of that. But the client comes along and says, hey, where do I get my file? And you have some metadata server that says, hey, your file is over here. And the client says, OK, that's cool. My file is over there, so I'm going to go and speak to the data service get the data, and send it back to the client. That's pretty cool, really. Ceph's even cooler. We can calculate the data location on the client and on the server. And because we can calculate where the data is, we don't need this single point of failure or replicate this area. And this also brings lots of other benefits. Hopefully I can jump on the next slide now and say, this, oh, well, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it and say, it's effectively a hash function. I assume everyone in the room knows what a hash function is. Is there anyone who doesn't know what a hash function is? Great, I'll skip that then. So, let's talk about the nice topic of no single point of failure. Um, we can actually have more than one node fail. We can define failure domains. And this has an extra utility because it means that we can migrate services to new nodes much easier because we have no single point of failure. So time for the next slide. So here we have a little picture of what makes up a Ceph cluster. Due to space and wanting things to be clear, I've put these things in a big box. This is the interface layer. Above, below this in the abstraction layer, we have a series of services that provide state. And then we have a security layer, which allows you to bind these parts together over a messaging system. Now I'm going to break down that a little bit further for you. The security layer is based on a shared secret system. We have one key per service, and we have some capabilities on that security layer all very boringly, reassuringly normal. Then we have an interface layer. And this is really neat. It's stateless. That means you can rip one out and put another one in and replace them. It means that you can put your reliability, say, with the iSCSI, I believe, built into the protocol. There's a fall over back end. That's correct, I think. And that allows you to sit there and bring up and bring down services much e easily, much more easily. So, then we get to the state layer. And this is where things start to get a little bit more complicated, but I'm still not delving into the complexities yet. Um, it's made up of two services. The Mon service, which is 
basically a re replicated database. Um, it ha elects a leader using something very similar to Paxos. Um, and so you typically want three, five, seven of them, so you can come to a voting and decide which one is the leader. And you never get what we call in Ceph a split brain, where the cluster split, splits into two. And that's one of those traditional problems that you get with distributed storage systems with no single point of failure. And then there's the OSD service, the object storage daemon, which is the data persistence layer. So let me go into a little bit more de details of what the Mon service does first. This stores the keys, it stores the crush map, this little algorithm, um, and that algorithm also takes in the data of what um, OSDs are available and their status of in, out, up and down. And this is all part of the crush map, but it's also stored by the Mon service so that things can synchronize. It also votes for the master, as I said, and it keeps a revision of the latest status of the cluster so that we can always have a consensus on what is the status of the cluster. So this is the OSDs, the object storage demons, and this is where all the data flows in and out of the Ceph cluster. Um, it connects to the Mon servers when it gets started, downloads the crush map, and then it can calculate where the data should be. This means that if data is missing, it can request the data, and if it's asked for the data, it knows what data it has, and it can then scrub that data and say, hey, I've got an extra copy here. I should delete this. So it's very important that it connects to the Mon service and actually gets the members and gets the crush map. It basically stores a little bit of metadata around its blobs, and its blobs are a variable size, but it's ideally that they're quite small. So that's the object storage daemon service. So now I'm going to jump into another area of Ceph. Forgive me for jumping around, but hopefully we can build up a picture of where we are. First, I started talking about the components that you see as a service. And now I'm going to start talking a little bit more about how these little blobs that we break our data down into get distributed around the cluster. So that's this section. And now I did go around asking people if they could play um, Kate Bush's Babushka song, but I realized that the word for Russian dolls is different in different languages and therefore it wouldn't really work with a mixed audience predominantly German speaking. So you miss the Kate Bush sound effects at this point. Um, but what we have on a sort of data placement view of the world, getting increasingly more specific as we go down this slide, is we have the Mon service which is storing the map of the cluster. And then we have the object storage demons one per disk. And then we have this concept of pools, which are, um, if you know logical volume management, they're a bit like um, either volume groups or logical volumes. They're places where you store your data, groupings. And then we have placement groups. Think of these as the buckets in your hash algorithm. And then we have placement groups for placement purposes, which is to abstract placement groups and it allows Ceph to do some sneaky tricks to avoid replicating data too frequently within the cluster. And so that's how your data goes from the output of a hash calculated by the client to being put in a location that's referenceable in the cluster. Um, so I think I've just explained that all too fast. Um, and I think these slides say a little bit more. Um, we then have rules on top about how we place these buckets. So we can add properties to this concept of a pool, this grouping of data, and say, hey, this grouping of data should be replicated three times. So should I lose one disk, I have two other copies on two other disks and I want to make sure those two other disks are on a different machine. So that way you can have fault tolerance and expect a whole machine to go down and you not to lose any data, not to get any downtime, and just keep your service running while Ceph can sit there and recalculate because it's now aware that that OSD no longer exists 
or that machine no longer exists and the collection of OSDs no longer exist, the crush map will then be changed by that because it no longer contains those OSDs. And so the, all of the MONs, the MONs update their crush map, the OSDs download that crush map update, and they know that they need to replicate that data. So pools are where we put in that metadata about the replication rules. And there's also a concept called erasure encoding that I'll come to later. So placement groups, as I said, they're sort of the, the bucket in a hash algorithm. And, oh, I think there's one interesting nasty that I said it was going to be the nice bits, and I've mostly included the nice bits of Seth. But one thing you should be warned is that placement groups, um, you can't shrink the number of thing, buckets you've got in a hash without recalculating everything through the hash. So we do have a problem in usability with Ceph that it's not really possible to shrink the number of buckets in the hash algorithm without going through a lot of computation. So that is one not nice bit. So it doesn't really fit in this talk, but I have to mention it to this audience because they want to know the nasty bits as well. That one has to sneak in. Placement groups for placement purposes are really just, as I said earlier, a way to avoid too much movement of data when something goes into or out of the Ceph cluster. So the next nice topic, after we've got in away from that nasty bit about not being able to shrink, shrink the number of buckets and only being able to split buckets easily, is we want to talk about something really cool that can save you money if you have a Ceph cluster. And that's erasure encoding. I'm pretty sure um, everyone has heard of RAID, RAID 10, RAID 1, RAID 0, RAID 5. But I'm going to come to that just in a second and say, by default, Ceph doesn't do erasure encoding. It does replication. We store all of our data three times with some fault tolerance rules. This is really fast to recover because we just can copy the data from one machine to another. It's annoying when it's six terabytes of data that you have to copy. It does take time, but you can just copy it. And it's reasonably fast to write something to Ceph. Ceph is all about reliability. So to actually get an acknowledgement that you've written something to disk, you actually need to get acknowledgement from three disks under this strategy to acknowledge that right. So your write latency is hit by working with Ceph. Now, erasure encoding, RAID 5 is probably, sorry, RAID, of the RAID classes, RAID 5 is probably the most common. I hope I've got the maths right later. I'm sure Lars will pick me up if I got it wrong. Um, typically on a five disk RAID 5 system, you'll have a 3-2 ratio in erasure encoding, no? Uh, RAID 5 is one parity disk. One parity disk, oops, okay. Okay, you're, you're absolutely right. I should have put six because no one should talk about five ever. Yeah. Sometimes we have one disk failing during rebuild, which is really, really dangerous. So if you have one disk failing and then another disk failing during rebuild, then your data is lost with RAID 5. And that's why I say RAID 5 shouldn't exist. And that's why I made the error here because you should never expect a single failure to happen when you're managing your data. Particularly, as Lars said earlier in the big um, summary talk, with distributed computing, the only thing you can be sure of is something's going to break. And Ceph allows you to have a variable number of parity disks. Um, so you can tune your cost for how much data do you wish to have in parity versus your performance and versus your failure, failure tolerance. So here I gave an example of 3-2 with five disks to store your data and two fa failures tolerated, um, giving a 40% overhead. Hoping I've not got the maths wrong again anywhere. Um, and then I was speaking uh, at a conference just recently. Um, I don't speak in that many conferences, but I was speaking at a conference recently and one site was going for the extreme efficiency, but still having some fault tolerance. 
and they were going for as cheap as they could possibly get, and they chose an 18-3 ratio. This is where they have 21 disks to store their data, and they tolerate three failures dur during its normal operation, giving only a 14.2% overhead for safety. But this is not without its costs. It's much more efficient in terms of da data usage, but it increases your latency. Because with an 18.3 setup, you need to write or read from 21 disks, potentially. When you're writing, you need to write 21 disks. So that's a lot of disks that have got to acknowledge your acceptance, um, acknowledge that you've written. And recovery from failure gets much longer, because now I've got to sit there and read 21 disks when I'm recovering from any one of those failures in the system. And it's not just a matter of copying, there's some calculation there. So recovery times increase considerably when you have erasure encoding enabled, and when you, particularly when you enable it with such high, ratio, high numbers of disks in your setup. So to overcome this for both programmatic and performance reasons, Ceph provides the idea of cache tiers. Um, Particularly for things like random I.O., these are absolutely essential. Uh, if you were just storing blobs in to a Ceph cluster with erasure encoding and retrieving blobs, then you might not need cache tiers depending on your performance requirements. But if you're going to be doing random I.O., you really need a cache layer in front of that, which fortunately Ceph provides. So I think I've given my talk a little bit too fast. I'm already on the take-home messages, but hopefully this will give us time for questions. And this was really only a dip your toe into what is Ceph. So, I gotta say, Ceph's really nice. It's got a nice, simple structure. Um, it scales nicely. Because we're doing the calculation on the client and individually in every area when we download that crush map, we don't need to talk to a single bottlenecked service. We can have the client speak directly to the storage service. And then we've got all these stateless services that are providing gateways to conventional protocols that allow us to have these stateless levels. So this makes deployment very easy. Um, there are some caveats. Um, because we've got so many machines, it actually gets better to use Ceph the more machines you put it in. And because of recovery, um, it's really, you can fill up your cluster more the more machines there are. So I like to say it's better with more than seven servers. I think you can go down quite small. You can even just run it on one machine. But my general feeling is it's better with more than seven servers. The no single point of failure makes upgrades very, very nice. The crush map is helping us scale. Um, the erasure encoding allows it to be very cheap. And that's really the summary of my very basic introduction to Ceph. I'm sorry I've been so fast on my talk. I still have 10 minutes for questions. So give me hell. Okay, how can a hash function work? What do you want to put to one place? If that's There's a microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, <clears throat> I'll ask my question while he's walking. Um, <clears throat> so you say that having the crush map make, makes upgrading easier, but isn't it a problem that if you want to, when you move things to the client, to change the algorithm, like the crush map algorithm, make changes on that layer, you would also have to upgrade all of the clients in synchrony. So that would seem to make it a little bit more a little bit less flexible on that layer. It's a little bit less flexible if you actually wanted to change the algorithm's calculating function. You do have to synchronize the clients with the server. That's correct. But mostly what you're doing is not changing that. And I'm sure that there's some versioning in there. I don't know. I haven't checked thoroughly. But most of the time, what you want to know is where do I want to put my data now? And where do I want to put my data now is usually with a synchronized, well, it has to be with a synchronized algorithm between the client and the server. 
and the critical element is to download what is the map of the cluster so that then I can calculate where I should put the data. Does that answer your question, saying I'm not absolutely sure, but um, you're absolutely right, I do have to have the algorithm synchronized? If you say I'm right, I'm happy. So. Okay. <laughs> a little bit related, but if you have a hash function, it must logically point you to one point. How yes. do you find your replicas if you need to? The, the hash function points you to one point, but that's a placement group. And that placement group is then described to be in multiple places within the system, I believe. But maybe Lars is going to correct me here. Yes. Whoa. So the placement, uh, the hash function actually points you to the primary OSD for a placement group, and the OSD server then behind the scenes replicates. So the client only only ever talks to the primary OSD, which the hash function points it at. Okay. And if that fails. Sorry. Uh, and if your primary OSD fails, then? Well, if your primary OSD fails, then you get a new map and it computes a new primary OSD. Ah. So, sorry, I stand corrected by last there. <laughs> Anything else that I can possibly try and answer and maybe get wrong or right? Oh, uh, please join the queue to ask. So you said that Ceph is predominantly for large enterprises, etc., which is fair enough. A lot of projects started off that way, targeting enterprise spaces. Do you see Ceph becoming more prevalent in uh, home use developer style scenarios? Yes, no. I think the answer is not until hardware makes some fundamental changes. Um, for me, it doesn't really make sense to have Ceph on a home system at the moment because hardware tends to have store, multiple storage nodes connected to a big, compute, a big computer. Um, I could see with the recent developments in disks, people putting the CPU next to the disk. And maybe when it becomes commodity to have systems like this, having seven network attached disks would allow Ceph to be very practical in the home use. Um, but it's quite a big scale for a simple MP3 collection. So if you've got those disks with integrated OSD functionality on them, how would you then add the Mons layer, etc.? cetera? Or was that all baked into the single drive? Um, in, this is me speculating about technology that I've only seen um, at the end of presentations and the beginning of presentations. But there's actual ARM computers being manufactured now that plug into the back of a SATA disk. They're about this sort of size, about this sort of thickness. And they're intended to be very, very cheap and work in servers at the moment. But I could see this technology coming to the consumer in the future. At the moment, the technology is not a good match for consumer, t consumer use, I'm afraid. Thanks. With the new versions of Ceph, uh, on previous versions, uh, the object, uh, it was more object-based storage. Uh, is the OLTP uh, or online transaction speed going to increase with the new versions? Uh, very nice question to ask because I just went to a talk which Sage, the project lead, gave and he informed us about the new backing of OSDs called Blue Store. We haven't baked it into our roadmap for release in Suzy Storage yet, but um, the initial performance benchmarks he showed us showed for right a doubling in performance by no longer using XFS um, and going directly to the disk layer. They're using RocksDB and their own format um, and no longer having an external journal 
and working around the file system as they described it, but going directly to the raw block device. And this doesn't produce advances in streaming reads because file systems are very optimized for streaming reads. But we should see um, for random reads and write loads, according to the graphs, I didn't do the benchmarks myself, a doubling in transaction performance for the same hardware. Um, that's for each individual piece of hardware. Do remember that you as a user then have to get that acknowledged by three nodes, so network latency issues may still not lead you to have a doubling in performance as an end user, but we can hope. <clears throat> so what does Ceph do for ensuring data integrity? Like if a disk gets corrupted, one of the storage nodes. Um, I'm not an expert in the details of scrubbing, but there are periodic um, runs through of all the placement groups to check their integrity. Um, maybe Lars has more details on that? Oh. No? Well, Qu exactly that. It rescans the data for consistency. Yeah. Um, the other talk about Blue Store, one of the big things that they were chucking into the system was um, hashes for all data stored. Um, so that there will be less effort in checking for failures than the current system. So they're improving this um, by improving the scrubbing system and making it more dependent on hashes. I believe there's some hashing in there, but it's not perfect yet in terms of you can switch this on, but it's not great. But with Blue Store, you get better hashing. And of course, you have multiple copies so that you can recover from the other copies or with erasure encoding, recover the chunks that make up the copy. Any more questions? Well, that's kind of good because I think I've actually gone five minutes over now. No? I'm on time. Well, I'm sorry it's not as bouncy a talk as last time, but thank you very much for attending. Um, sorry for my errors about RAID 5. Um, I think I will have to call it a day then and say thank you very much for coming. Oh.